The meeting is now live, Warden Danielson. Good evening, everyone. And uh, welcome to our first Zoom open house to hear your voices on a proposed shoreline preservation bylaw. There is no doubt that the county and our four member municipalities are contemplating taking a greater stance on the issue of protecting our shorelines, given their importance to our environment overall and to the economy of the county. While we, while we will follow the formal process for a council meeting, I do wanna let you know that members of county council are here only to listen this evening and not to debate or take questions. The purpose of this meeting is to allow our independent consultants to hear your concerns or level of support for, a cert for certain aspects of shoreline preservation. Council has heard many of these comments loud and clear as well as the degree of confusion that exists around what was initially being proposed. While we do understand that some of you may have a high degree of frustration, we would ask that decorum and respect be maintained throughout the meeting. Um, uh, Mr. CAO, if you could take a roll call of council, please. Warden Danielson. I'm here. <laughs> Councillor Moffat. Present. Councillor Roberts. Present. Councillor McKechnie. Present. Councillor Burton. Present. Councillor Ryle. Present. And Councillor DeVolan. Present. And I know Councillor Shell won't be joining us tonight, but we'll be reviewing the video later. Thank you. Could I have a mover and a seconder to adopt the agenda as presented, please? Councillor DeVolan and Councillor Moffat. Moved by Councillor DeVolan, seconded by Councillor Moffat, be it resolved that the agenda for the July 29th, 2021 special meeting of Halliburton County Council be hereby approved. All in favor? That's carried. Is there any notice of pecuniary interest or general nature thereof? Hearing none, uh, without further ado, I will be turning the meeting over to our representatives from Hutchinson Environmental Sciences Limited and JL Richards and Associates to manage your delegations and to hear and take note of your comments and concerns. With us this evening, we have Brent Parsons, Jason Farrigan, Garang Candelwa, and Andrea Smith. Uh, gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Warden Danielson and members of council for uh, hosting this meeting this evening. And for everybody who's joined us, welcome as well. We look very much forward to the conversation that we're going to have tonight. This is one of two open houses that we have planned as part of our independent review of the county's work on uh, a new shoreline preservation bylaw. And as Warden Danielson has indicated, the intent tonight really is to hear your views and your perspectives on shoreline preservation in the county. I see that my colleague Garang has pulled up the presentation. Thank you for that, Garang. And before we um, go through the agenda for the open house and we have an, uh, an opportunity to introduce my colleagues, just one small housekeeping matter, if we could, which relates to the registration um, that you all went through to be able to participate tonight. Um, and that will come into play later uh, in the meeting. Garang, if maybe we can move to the next slide, please. So um, we have a small presentation that we are going to go through to help sort of set the stage, uh, if you will, before we turn the meeting over to you, because we really do want to hear uh, your perspective. Now, when we get to that portion of the meeting, when um, we are inviting you to provide your perspective, um, what we're going to go is we'll go through the list of stakeholders that have pre-registered uh, to speak. So we will go through those speakers in the order that individuals have registered for the open house tonight. So when that happens, the meeting host is going to bring you into the meeting when it is your turn to speak. Now, uh, when you pre-registered, you provided the county with a display name. So the display name that you use to log into the open house tonight should be the same as the display name that you used when you registered uh, for the open house. Now, in the event that the display name is not the same as the display name that you used when you registered, this slide illustrates how you can in fact change your display name. So if you look down uh, on the image that we have displayed, so if you're looking at your Zoom slide and you want to change your display name, you can do so by clicking on the participants button on the bottom toolbar you can click on your name and then click rename. 
and then you can type in the new display name, which corresponds with the name that you use when you registered and hit OK. And so that should ensure that the, the names are consistent and we can take people in the order that people have registered. Now, when you're called in to speak, uh, please unmute yourself using the mute unmute button at the bottom uh, left hand corner of the toolbar. And then, of course, once everybody who has pre-registered to speak has had an opportunity to do so, um, we'll open up the floor uh, to anyone uh, who's joined the meeting and, and who hadn't registered and may have uh, a, a perspective to share uh, as well. So when we get to that stage of the meeting, if you'd like to, um, if you haven't registered and you'd like to ask a question, you can do so by using the raise the hand feature within Zoom. And at that time, the meeting host will then bring you into the meeting and then you'll be called upon to provide your perspective or to provide uh, your perspective or question, excuse me. And of course, um, we're all on webcam. So as soon as you're brought in the meeting to speak, if you have a webcam and it's live, we'll see you uh, on video. Now, if you join the webinar by phone, you can dial star nine to raise your hand. When called upon, Zoom will prompt you to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. So hopefully that's helpful to folks. Grain, we'll go down to the, to the next slide, please. So in terms of this evening, we've, we've structured our conversation um, uh, according to sort of seven parts. So what we'd like to do on our end is take the opportunity to, to introduce ourselves to you um, as the consulting team that the county has hired to conduct uh, this independent review. We're then going to quickly touch on the assignment that county council has tasked us with. We're going to go quickly go over the approach that we are taking uh, to this review. And... Um, check in briefly on the work that we have done to date and our emerging understanding uh, of your community. And then we get to the most important part of the meeting, which is you. So at that stage in the meeting, we're gonna turn it over to everyone who has registered to speak um, because we do wanna understand your perspectives. When we get through the speakers, I think right now we have approximately 30 individuals who have registered to speak. Um, we will do our best to provide a summary of key themes of what we've heard and potentially some preliminary feedback based upon those themes. And then from there, we can describe the next steps in the process. And as I mentioned at the outset, of course, this is the first of two open houses that we are currently uh, have planned uh, for this very important assignment for the county. Greg, if we can go down to the next slide, please. So who are we? Well, um, our team is comprised of two different consulting uh, firms, uh, which are displayed here on this slide. So uh, as Warden Danielson has mentioned, my name is Jason Farragut. I'm a senior planner with JL Richards and Associates Limited. JL Richards and Associates is a full service planning, engineering and architectural uh, firm uh, that provides a wide range of services to clients, both public and private sector. Importantly, in the context of this assignment, our firm provides in-house land use planning services for approximately 30 municipalities across the province of Ontario. And we also have a healthy uh, practice where we work with uh, the development industry to help them move their projects forward uh, as well. So we take a very balanced uh, view uh, towards all projects um, that we engage with. And I have the pleasure this evening of being joined by my colleague, Graham Kandawal, who's a planner with JLR as well. Maybe Brent, I can turn it over to you to uh, to sort of introduce yourself and Andrea, please. Jason, and hi everyone. Uh, my name is Brent Parsons. Um, I'm a aquatic scientist with Hutchinson Environmental Sciences. Um, our company is focused on lake and watershed management, uh, and our head office is in Bracebridge. So we're very familiar with the county uh, and waterfront development issues throughout central Ontario. Um, I'm being assisted with this project um, from our founder, Dr. Neil Hutchinson. He's going to provide senior direction and review deliverables. He has um, 42 years of experience. He's developed provincial policy for lake management, the Ministry of Environment in the District of Muskoka for over 20 years. And um, Dr. Andrea Smith is going to lead our scientific, scientific review, and she is also uh, a part of the meeting tonight. She has 25 years of experience and she's accomplished at scientific research and synthesis and is also the editor of the scientific journal Lake and Reservoir Management. And lastly, yeah, um, yeah again, Brent Parsons, I'm going to be the project manager, coordinate efforts um, along with Jason and be the point of contact with the county. I have 14 years of experience mm -hmm. and it's predominantly being focused on waterfront development. And like Jason and JLR, my experience has been uh, quite balanced between guiding private parties through the approvals process 
and providing expertise to municipalities, conservation authorities, Ministry of Environment, um, and other organizations for the development of management recommendations and science-based policies. So uh, yeah, we'll endeavor to bring that balanced perspective to this project. Great, thank you for that, Brent. So Garang, maybe we can move down to the next slide, please. So in terms of our assignment, County Council has tasked us, as the slide indicates, with providing an independent and an objective review of the uh, tremendous amount of work that went into creating the draft shoreline preservation uh, bylaw for the county. And our assignment really consists of three distinct uh, yet interrelated streams of work. The first is the scientific literature review, which uh, our colleagues at Hutchinson Environmental Sciences are undertaking. The second is then to go look at successful practices elsewhere. So we have uh, are in the midst of conducting a scan of uh, successful practices in other municipal jurisdictions that are comparable uh, to the county to understand what worked and what didn't work in those instances. And then finally, uh, we're, we're talking both to members of the public and stakeholders to understand their perspectives and their views on the shoreline preservation uh, bylaw as well. So as I sort of say, three distinct yet highly interrelated uh, streams of work. Garang, the next slide, please. So that's what we've been asked to do. Now, how do we actually do the work? Well, our work program for the county is divided into two distinct phases of work, which began in May of this year and will conclude later in October. And the first phase of the work really is the startup phase, which um, has uh, occurred in May and June. And really in that phase, what we're doing is we're trying to understand the nature of the assignment and ensure that we're uh, meeting county council's expectations for the outcome of this assignment. The second phase of work, which as we've indicated on this slide is understanding and direction. And that's really when we jump into the, the heart of the work itself um, and begin to wrap our, both our arms and our heads uh, around this assignment, if you will. And as this slide indicates, we're about 40% uh, of the way through this second phase of work. Um, this second, the next step in this process will be for us then to take um, the preliminary findings that we reach uh, with an interim report to County Council uh, in August. At that point in time, we'll be seeking some direction from County Council. Uh, then we'll be putting some further uh, analysis to the direction that we receive and, and uh, put the meat on the bones, if you will, to uh, sort of the directions. And then what we'll be doing is a second round of consultation with folks uh, prior to bringing our final recommendations forward to County Council later in October. Gareng? So how are public and the stakeholders involved? Well, County Council has approved a process which involves two significant rounds of community and stakeholder consultation. And this open house is part of the first round of the consultation process. So what we're trying to understand tonight is your perspectives on shoreline preservation as we've indicated. So uh, this is what we describe as the what and the why. Uh, as we get further into the process, we will get into the how of preserving uh, shorelines and successful practices or sustainable practices to begin to be, excuse me, to bring to the county. And when we get to that stage, we will be reaching out to the public and stakeholders again to get your views on the how elements of this assignment. So this is not our only conversation. Uh, we will obviously be talking tonight and we look forward to talking to folks again as we continue to proceed through our process. The Greg, the next slide, please. So we've been doing some work. Uh, how are we doing and what are we starting to see? Well, in terms of the scientific literature review, Brent, I don't know, did you wanna cover this one sure. off? Yeah, that'd be great. Um, yeah, as, as the the points on the on the slide. So we've consulted with six scientific experts in the realm of shoreline preservation. And uh, Andrea and I have reviewed 54 scientific papers relating to shorelines. Um, that task is generally going to be to accomplish two things. Uh, number one, to document scientific evidence for the role of shoreline protection and naturalization in water quality protection, erosion and flood control, and provision of wildlife habitat. And then two is to, is to dive a little bit deeper and try to document rationale for specific setback distances and buffer widths to inform the ultimate policies that are recommended. And as part of the next step, the successful, the documentation of successful municipal practices, we're 
working on that alongside JLR. And we're going to review existing mechanisms that are in effect in, that are in effect in the county, which has already been completed. And we're currently uh, researching approaches in uh, a number of other comparable municipalities. Through that research, we are going to summarize the legislative and planning mechanisms that are used, the prohibitions, exemptions, and the effectiveness of those policies, as well as document the details such as specific setback distances, buffer sizes, minimum frontages, and minimum lot sizes. Thanks, Jason. Great, thanks for that, Brent. And then in terms of public and stakeholder engagement, as I indicated, um, we're well into that uh, component of the assignment. So some of you may have noticed that we've uh, taken the time working with uh, county staff to update the county's website for shoreline preservation to reflect the initiative that county council has given us direction to undertake. Um, since we met with county council in June, we've managed to touch base I think this slide is a little dated uh, when we released this this morning. We've now conducted 17 one-on-one -on -one interviews with stakeholders that reflect a broad range of perspectives from across the county, um, uh, which have been very informative and have been very enriching. We have also received and reviewed, and again, this number is a little bit dated because it's, it's from this morning. So we've re received a number of submissions today, but I would think it's safe to say that we've received and reviewed well over 20 submissions now from stakeholders, residents, and business owners on uh, lakes within the county, the, the, the concept of lake health, shoreline preservation uh, as well, receiving both concerns and questions uh, or support for the initiative as well. And then we've also designed a community survey that will be launched after the open house this evening. And that survey will ask residents a series of questions that will further inform our work uh, and our analysis of the draft shoreline bylaw. Greg, the next slide. So in, ter in terms of our emerging understanding, well, you know, it's clear that the, you know, the county is, is truly a special place within Ontario. And, the county is blessed with a tremendous amount uh, of water resources and um, using our geographic information system and conducting a little bit of a high level analysis of the county, the county has over 951 bodies of water. And that's a very specific term that's intended to capture both lakes and rivers and streams and ponds. And a lot of the uh, bodies of water are, are, are what are known as cold water bodies of water, 4% are cool, and 32% are warm. And of course, as we've learned through our process of research and our consultation with people, the county is also very unique because it's a, it, it includes a combination of both what I would describe as natural lakes, quote unquote, as well as the reservoir lakes that form part of the Trent Severn waterway system. And each of those lakes has uh, their own distinct characteristics and issues and opportunities when it comes to questions around shoreline preservation. Now, interestingly, in the county, approximately 49% of land within the county is within the private patent system, which means that 51% is within the Crown uh, land system still. So the Crown clearly uh, continues to play a large and important role in ensuring the health and the quality of the lakes within the county moving forward. Now, looking at the private lots around the lakes themselves, no surprise, the, large percentage, the, the largest percentage of waterfront lots around uh, the water bodies within the county, excuse me, our private patent. And interestingly, 82% of the waterfront lots within the county are residential. And, and that's taken directly from the Municipal Property Assessment Corporation. And they have an average lot size of about 11,500 square meters, which is generally about two acres if you wanted to do the conversion really quickly but a median lot size of 3,000 square meters. And what that means is, from a median perspective, half of the lots, private patent lots, waterfront lots within the county are below 3,000 square meters in area, while the other half are above. Now, the remaining 15% of private patent lands along water bodies in the county are vacant, and they have an average lot size of about 45,000 square meters, and again, a median lot size of about 5,200. And the difference between, we find the difference between the average and the median to actually to be quite interesting, and it, I think, reflects the diversity of land use characteristics that, are, uh, that exist within the county today. Gareng, the next slide, please. 
Now, in, in terms of what we've heard so far through our conversations with folks, it's very clear to us that all stakeholders, regardless of perspective uh, within the county, value the lakes uh, within Halliburton. And I think it's safe to say from the conversations that we've had that stakeholders also support the idea of healthy lakes. And that is broadly supported. I don't think that anybody wants to see, at least the folks that we've spoken to, wanted to see the, the water quality uh, deteriorate on the lakes. People understand that lakes are important and they want to see them be successful and sustainable in the future. And interestingly, from our conversation so far, there is an understanding that additional approaches to sustainable waterfront development may be required. And there is definitely a desire for those approaches to be reasonable, balanced, clear, understandable um, to an average individual, achievable. If, if the county is going to do something, I think what we've heard from folks is everybody wants it to be successful. So that is the, the achievable and the effective component uh, of that bullet. So, so that's who we are. That's what we've been asked to do. That's the progress that we've made to date. Now we're on to the most important part of the meeting, I think, which is your perspective. So Garang, maybe what we'll do is we'll take this slide down. And if you like working with Mike, maybe we can start bringing uh, folks into the room and we can sort of hear what they think. We'll be bringing in Mr. Bill Misson. Hello, Mr. Misson. Would you mind turning your video on or unmuting yourself? There, how's that? Very good. Can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Right. I'm Bill Misson. I'm a director with the NBC Lakes Property Owners Association, and we're in Algonquin Township. Uh, we, we do support the need for clean uh, water and through shoreline pre uh, protection. Uh, we find the current draft bylaw as it stands is very prescriptive and in fact uh, probably divisive in terms of what it's, it's been doing up to date and appreciate the opportunity to speak to you and others so that uh, we can give our perspective. Uh, rather than and spend a whole bunch of time on the whole bylaw, we decided to focus on three main issues. Uh, the first one is the 30 meter rule. We were one of the original lakes that helped in support of the uh, Love Your Lake program, which most people are familiar with. Um, we question how we've gone from the 10 foot, three meter ribbon of life to now uh, 30 meters. Uh, find it overly excessive. We know you're looking at the science that supports 30 meters, I and mean, that's good. Um, we're not sure what is wrong with the science that supports the original ribbon of life, uh, three meter rule, five meters or 10 meters. 30 meters we find is very excessive. Uh, why not also be conducting, I know it's not your purview, but to our, our uh, county reps, why not actually be doing shoreline testing, physical testing to see what is on. The three leaks below the described. Um, so why not test actual sites where there's known uh, good uh, filtration and there's problems that have been noted on the, uh, on the septic system reviews. The second point we like to talk about is the uh, enforcement. And as, as you put up on your note, it's a large county with 951 bodies of water. And it's been said that there's going to be a need for one more bylaw officer to assist in the enforcement of this bylaw. Um, we, like many others, think that that is uh, very understated to try and monitor what's going on, on let alone actually the out -owners. Uh, So what is the cost that's going to hit us with this? I think it's unfortunately going to go back to neighbors policing neighbors. And, you know, uh, maybe it didn't happen so much, but the COVID-19 police have been out watching what everybody's been doing. You're going to be creating people that are, are, are massaging trees or doing something to their property and is it reportable or not? 
So we don't think it's going to create a great neighbor policy. And one of the things that, that we all enjoy in our, through our Lake Association is the camaraderie of the members that are um, belonging to it. The existing bylaw is not enforced, and I won't get into details, but we have a couple of examples on these lakes where it hasn't been put in place and, again, uh, leads to question how are we going to ensure that the new bylaw is enforced. I want to close on talking about ownership rights. And, um, you know, the, the lakefront property owners, at least the ones who are a group and, and people that I speak to, they're threatened by a law. Now, now, we shouldn't be threatened by anything that's happening, but least of all from our government shouldn't be threatening that. Owners are feeling that they're totally losing control of their property, particularly if it's 30 meters. Now, now I know the bylaw doesn't say that, but I come from private industry and we, we had a thing when we, we approved something that, that I would call a capital project, but you might call it a bylaw in this case. And, and in doing that, it got approved. And then we had a thing we called creeping elegance. Things very quietly got added on, and then it becomes even more prescriptive than what we see right now. As an example, we could be told, you now have to make 25 of that 30 meter has to, has to have the shoreline vegetation that was proposed through the ribbon of life. Anyways, if, if you don't know it and they haven't heard that, uh, a lot of people do feel threatened by it. It also was said that lakefront property owners Owners Association don't represent all the people on the lake. And, and that is true. But there's a lot of people who have opinions on here who aren't impacted directly by the decisions that are going to be made. They don't own lakefront properties. So as a way to ease that feeling, who doesn't love trees and shrubs and deep-rooted flowers? So, so why don't the whole county go and have a 30-meter rule? Now, that, that may be a little excessive or be a, a little facetious in nature. What we're coming to a significant compromise on the 30 meters or scrap the whole bylaw. Uh, those are the comments that I have tonight on behalf of the NBC. Yeah, well, thank you very much for that, Bill. We appreciate uh, hearing your perspective on those on those issues. So next, I believe, Mike, we have Napier Simpson to bring into the room. Mr. Simpson is not on the Zoom call, so I'll be bringing in uh, Connor Harris. Thank you. Oh, Mike, maybe this is uh, my mistake, sorry. Uh, Garang and I spoke with Mr. Harris earlier this afternoon and he had indicated that he had registered for the session, but as a result of our conversation through the stakeholder discussions that he would be monitoring the meeting this evening. My apologies. So perhaps with that, we can move to Mr. Dave Love. Well, So all this coming into the Zoom meeting. Mr. Love, you're now in the meeting. You can unmute yourself. Hello. I'm unmuted. Can Hi, Dave. Me? We can hear you great. Yeah. So my name is Dave Love. My wife, Judy, and I are very fortunate to be lifelong cottagers on both Halliburton Lake, where our cottage has been in her family since 1954, as well as on Lake Muskoka, where our family cottage there has been in my family since 1946. We understand the benefits of maintaining a healthy shoreline environment and a high level of water quality in our lakes. The current and future enjoyment of these properties by our family and our guests has relied on this land and water stewardship approach for four generations spanning 75 years. I therefore believe that I am qualified to address this meeting and appreciate the opportunity to do so. First of all, I would like to thank council for making the time to allow stakeholders such as ourselves to provide our views and inputs on this significant proposed legislation. 
As most council members are not owners of waterfront properties themselves, their decision to seek input from those of us who are is much appreciated. As I stated in my five page submission to County Council back on January 23rd, I do not see nor understand the need for this additional control over our private waterfront property rights. As everyone knows, we, are al we already have many restrictions and regulations in place to help protect our shorelines and those do not need repeating here. Furthermore, educating the public on how to keep our lakes and shorelines healthy is an ongoing objective of governments, cottager associations and many other organizations and has been for decades. From what I have learned about this proposal, the main objective is to achieve shorelines which are classified as 75% naturalized or regenerated, and which by doing so will maintain high water quality, prevent algae blooms, protect against the risk of, the of eroding shorelines and flooding. Pro proposing this bylaw to quote, further strengthen existing controls suggests to me that Halliburton's lakes and shorelines currently are in such a state of deterioration as to require urgent government attention to save them from serious harm. So I have searched for evidence of the burning platform. However, I'm unable to find any evidence which supports deteriorating conditions on the county website. And instead I have turned to the Lake Health Report published in 2019 by the Coalition of Halliburton Property Owners Association and other material as well to understand the current state of our lakes and shorelines and specifically the four areas of concerns, namely water quality, algae blooms, shoreline erosion and flooding. In brief, I've learned that According to the classifications in the Lake Health Report, the shorelines of Halliburton's largest 60 lakes are already trending towards a 75% naturalized condition with 47% identified as natural and 28% identified as regenerative, which is defined as quote, growing back towards a natural state, end quote. And this is without the presence of another bylaw. In 2015, 16 and 17, at least three lakes in Algonquin Park were closed to, due to algae blooms despite their shorelines being 100% natural. Water quality is measured by several parameters and according to the Lake Health Report, the 60 Halliburton Lake studied met or exceeded those parameters in five of the six categories. Seasonal flooding in Halliburton is the result of many factors but is mainly dependent on water management practices and the weather regardless of shoreline classification. So based on much, based on much of what I have read about the shoreline erosion in health, a 30 meter setback seems excessive to me especially given the vast diversity of shoreline features we see in Halliburton, from steep cliffs to sandy beaches. For many, if not most shoreline property owners, that distance encompasses as much as half of their total property area, including their residents. The Love Your Lake report a few years ago stated that, quote, the first 10 to 15 meters of land that surround the lakes and rivers are responsible for 90% of lake life, end quote, and recommended a riparian, a riparian buffer minimum of 10 meters to be maintained. That's a long way from 30 meters. I would ask if council has been presented with a detailed and costed plan, including the annual cost to taxpayers of not only enforcing this new bylaw with qualified individuals, but also maintaining an ongoing system to measure lake and shoreline quality trends across the county into the future in order to accurately measure and report on the tangible benefit of implementing this bylaw as compared to continuing with the existing laws. Alternatively, I might suggest that councils in Halliburton consider prioritizing taxpayers' money towards other, perhaps more pressing environmental challenges, namely the management of organic waste disposal and the thoroughly, thorough, thorough recycling of paper, plastics, and chemical products, including old solar panels and batteries. Finally, this unnecessary imposition of government controls over private property rights seems to mirror a similar worrisome trend occurring elsewhere. For example, the Biden government has announced plans to move one third of the rural land in the United States to a state of quote conservation. That's a problem in places where Nebraska, like Nebraska, where 95% of the land is privately owned. I worry that legislation such as this shoreline bylaw is unnecessarily opening the door to similar controls here, since in our own case, it will govern much of what we do to 50% of our property. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. We appreciate hearing that perspective. You're welcome. Mike, if we if we can bring Susan Hay in next, please. Am I ready to, to go? We can hear you loud and clear, Susan. Great, okay. 
Well, good evening. My name is Susan Hay, and I represent uh, Environment Halliburton this evening. Um, we're a small uh, volunteer organization that advocates for the protection of the natural environment in Halliburton County. The following story is an illustration of why Environment Halliburton supports the development of an effective shoreline preservation bylaw. In November of 2020, 10 lakes in Halliburton County had confirmed blue-green algae blooms and one of them was the, uh, on the lake where my husband and I reside. Our home had a lake-based water system. Our lake steward advised us not to use our water for any reason. We had to buy water for cooking, washing the dishes and even for bathing. We moved out of our house for about a month hoping that the algae would dissipate. In spite of what was reported in the local newspapers, the algae in our lake did not dissipate and became trapped in the ice in December. And not even the top scientists who study algae knew if it was safe to use our lake water during the winter. We made arrangements to have our, a well drin, drilled. The total cost of replacing our lake-based water system, along with the necessary re-landscaping was about $30,000. We felt that we had no option but to have a well drilled if we ever wanted to be able to sell our home, which under non-pandemic circumstances would have lost significant value with the confirmation of blue-green algae. By the time the ice thawed in the spring, the algae had disappeared, but now every day they go down to the dock fearing what may appear. I share this story because I fear that people don't yet understand how awful it is to have this, this happen. The lake on which I live is a small but busy lake. Our annual phosphorus sample was always below the allowable level. We thought we were safe from the threat of blue-green algae, but we weren't. Stimulating our economy by responding to blue-green algae blooms is not the way we want to grow the economy of Halliburton County. The effect of persistent blue-green scum on our lakes would be disastrous. Climate warming is a game changer for how we care for our lakes. Canada is warming faster than most of the rest of the world. Our lakes are more vulnerable because warmer waters contain less oxygen. A lake is like a community. Many factors contribute to its health. Too much phosphorus or nitrogen, water that's too warm or even too little calcium can adversely affect the microscopic aquatic organisms that eat the algae in our lakes. Preserving natural shorelines is really the number one way that we can reduce the negative impact of climate change and damaging development along our shorelines. Many studies and official plans confirm that a minimum buffer of 30 meters of natural vegetation is the best way to re reduce erosion and protect our lakes and the fish, birds and wildlife that, that inhabit them and also the people who enjoy the lakes. You can't help but notice that the rain that we get now come in, comes in deluges, which creates washouts in our driveways and roads. Without leafy vegetation to absorb the shock of water droplets and deep roots to hold the soil, our lakes become cloudy with sediment and inevitably pollutants of one sort or another. The complaint-based tree preservation bylaw has failed to provide enough protection against the removal of trees and vegetation. People don't want to tattle on their neighbors. It's widely accept, uh, accepted that development should be limited to a maximum of 25% of the shoreline around a lake. A couple of years ago, the Love Your Lake program assessed 60 lakes in the county and found that only five lakes met the standard. The other 55 had far less than 75% of the shorelines in a natural state. I see an analogy between the state of our shorelines and the way that we've allowed climate change to become climate chaos. We need an approach to living near our lakes that is much more respectful of nature. And to make sure that happens, a permit-based, adequately enforced shoreline preservation bylaw is needed to protect not only our lakes, but our economy and the long-term well-being of our county. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Susan. We appreciate hearing your views. Mike, maybe we can let Mike Thomas into the room next if he's joining the meeting tonight. Mike Thomas is not on the meeting, so I'll be bringing in Mike Thorne. Thank you. Mike 
All right. Good evening, members of County Council and consultants. Can you hear me? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay. Uh, again, my name is Mike Thorne, and I'm the Lake Steward um, for Gull Lake. And uh, while I cannot speak for all cottage owners on Gull Lake, I can talk about what's important to many of the cottage owners as a result of, uh, I guess, workshop and a survey that we did <clears throat> when we were developing our lake plan um, in 2012, 13, 14. And the first workshop that we had, we had uh, 52 participants um, and it was dealing with values, issues and actions. And on the values, certainly um, there was <clears throat> natural shoreline views, beauty and lakefront habitat was important and appropriate shoreline development and trees versus huge cottages or boat houses. So again, there was, there was certainly concern at that time. And then when <clears throat> we uh, said to the, the folks, what, what are the actions that you would take? And with regard to natural shorelines, um, the answers were create shoreline preservation bylaws, protect natural shorelines and native plants, natural rocks and natural rocks if possible, restore natural shorelines and naturalize shorelines with native plants, leave shorelines natural, change bylaws to regain shorelines and return them to a natural state. So at that time, even though there was there was only 50 people, um, it was still a significant amount that were indicating their, their concern with regard to shorelines. We then undertook a survey monkey um, survey. And uh, I would just like to point out uh, a couple of the questions and answers that we had. We had a total of 218 respondents on the lake. So that represents almost uh, 50 percent of the uh, of the owners on the lake and with regard to the the question of <clears throat> one of the questions we asked was identify the level of importance that the following values <clears throat> are to add to your experience on Gull Lake and natu of natural shorelines was considered very important or moderately important we had 94 <clears> percent <throat> of the respondents were, were positive. Um, and with regard to, uh, I guess, another question, um, please identify the level of negative impact the following items would have on your enjoyment of the lake um, <clears throat> with vegetation removal along the shoreline. There was 150 or 70% or of the residents <clears throat> said it would be a significant impact or a moderate impact. Um, and uh, I, I guess one of the other pertinent questions was in order to protect and enjoy Gull Lake, what following actions would you take? Uh, number one, uh, protect or improve the natural shoreline. We had 184 of the 218 respond that they were strongly in favor or somewhat in favor. And uh, <clears throat> on the question of restriction, restrict removal of shoreline vegetation, we had 154 or <clears throat> more than 60% uh, were strongly in favor or certainly somewhat in favor. The other thing we'd like to point out is that the GLCA had sponsored uh, two shoreline restoration projects um, along with uh, homeowners uh, who were winners in a, in a, in a, in a contest, uh, basically to indicate our support for shoreline preservation. I think one of the, th one of the issues that we found in the past is where we have observed on our, some of our shoreline, uh, I, I guess a, a destruction of all the trees. Well, uh, some, <clears throat> contractor has gone in and cleared cleared a lot on behalf of a homeowner 
And there's been difficulty in that sort of enforcement. And so we're looking forward to, um, <clears throat> I guess, a strong, a stronger enforcement of a shoreline reservoir to protect, <clears throat> to protect our lake. And uh, I would also say uh, there is a concern over the, the 30 meter distance. However, um, I think many of our <clears throat> association um, members and, and others on the lake are, um, are waiting to hear, I think, the scientific reasons that will support the, uh, <clears throat> the distances recommended. So on, on behalf of the association, I, I, I want to thank you, thank you and uh, just reiterate uh, our, our support um, <clears throat> for, the, uh, for the shoreline preservation bylaw. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mike. We, we appreciate that very much. Okay, next is Ian Dara. Uh, hello, uh, councillors and um, consultants. Thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, to speak to you. I'm a cottage owner on Lake Kachuk Wigamog, and um, I uh, support the uh, the proposed bylaw. What I'm noticing over the last couple of years is um, there is there has been a lot of um, development, a lot of building of larger homes on. Uh, Kashawigamog Lake. Um, I've seen large lawns cleared that slope right down to the lake, with no um, no no trees or vegetation left as a band along the lake. Um, I've seen the development of uh, large marinas right along the lake shore, where there is not uh, vegetation left along the lake shore, and so you have runoff right into the lake. Um, I'd like to echo the comments from um, <clears throat> Environment Halliburton. Um, I think we, with climate change accelerating, we need to think not only what the current situation is now, but looking ahead 10 and 20 years, clearly uh, we are seeing a rapid acceleration of climate change. Currently, um, as I think Brent Parsons noted, um, a large number of the lakes have cool, cold or cool water. Um, but I suggest we need to start thinking that, that our lakes may be under a lot of pressure um, in the next 10 or 20 years. And so it seems to me that one of the key values of um, our properties on in Halliburton County is the cleanliness of our lakes, the swimmability of our lakes, um, just the, 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 the fishing in our lakes, the recreational value uh, of Halliburton County is really the, one of the key economic drivers in the county. Um, and so to preserve this key value that we have as a county, I, I strongly support the proposed shoreline preservation bylaw. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. We appreciate hearing that. Mike, if we can let uh, Deb Ratchko into the meeting next, please. And hopefully I'm pronouncing Deb's last name correctly and Deb, I'll apologize in advance if I didn't. Deb is entering the meeting. Good evening, everyone. I'm assuming you can hear me. Um, yeah. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present. My name is Deb Rachko, and I'm the president of the Kinesis Lake Cottage Owners Association, the KLCOA. 
The KLCOA membership includes over 600 seasonal and permanent resident residence properties on Kinesis Lake and Dysart at L. We are privileged to be able to enjoy our shoreline properties. And I don't have to tell you that we're here in Halliburton County primarily for our lakes and our excellent water quality. We've heard that a number of times tonight. However, because we're here and because we are using the lakes, we're also affecting the water quality by adding nutrients to the lakes, primarily through our septic systems. The data that we've collected through our water quality testing programs on the Kinesis Lakes does show increased nutrient levels since testing began over 20 years ago, with occasional spikes in nutrients in some years. On the Kinesis Lakes, we're at the top of our watershed, so most of the impact is from those of us who use the lakes. Maintaining healthy lakes and good water quality is a priority for the KLCOA and our members. There are only a few things that we as individuals and a community can do to substantively protect our water quality. One is to maintain a regular and regularly inspect our septic systems to ensure that they're functioning properly. Two, protect our existing shoreline vegetation to act as a buffer for the nutrients and siltation entering our lakes from our septic systems and overdevelopment. If the shoreline is bare, then nutrient silt and soil can freely flow into the lake, smothering benthic creatures, which play a vital role in the health of the aquatic ecosystems. And the third thing is eliminate the use of fertilizers on shoreline properties. For many years, the KLCOA has endeavored to protect our water quality by successfully advocating for the implementation of mandatory septic inspections. The KLCOA has also encouraged Halliburton County to strengthen the shoreline tree preservation bylaw to include natural vegetation. The KLCOA performs water quality testing on our lakes to monitor changes in nutrient levels and also has been promoting the elimination of fertilizer use on our lakes for education. I'm not here today to support or not support the bylaw. I'm not here today to rep represent the views and opinions of all of our members or other shoreline property owners on our lakes. They will have an opportunity to weigh in. As you are collecting input from our Halliburton community and doing your best to consider the science around shorelines and their impact on our water quality, we do ask that you provide our members and everyone in the county with a clear concise and easy to understand version of the draft bylaw before you move on to the next round of public consultations. Back in January, there was some backlash, backlash to the proposed bylaw based on social media posts, word of mouth and third party interpretations. The only information we had from the county was the published draft bylaw. Unfortunately, as is the case, the draft bylaw document is written in bylaw language that most people don't take the time to read or fully understand. In order for our members to provide thoughtful feedback, they need to know and understand what the bylaw is, why it's necessary, what is in it, and how it will directly affect them. We need a Coles Notes version directly from the people drafting the bylaw to support meaningful discussion and feedback. I hope as you move forward with drafting the bylaw, you keep this in mind. Thank you again for allowing me this time to present this evening. Thank you, Deb, very much. So Mike, maybe we can bring John McBrien or McBreen into the meeting, please. Uh, John is not on the Zoom call this evening, so I'll be bringing in Larry Gannon. Great, thank you. Hello, uh, good evening everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to ask for a few questions. Um, my first comment is, um, you know, the people on the lakes are, um, that are at much more risk um, are much more likely to support and implement any advice on the, uh, or, or the bylaws that are being entertained. And as an example, what I've heard is um, we've had 10 lakes recently that were a problem out of the, uh, of the lakes that are in the area, which is uh, less than the 1%. My understanding is that other areas like Muskoka are identifying high risk lakes and implementing bylaws specific to the lakes that are at risk. And I'd like to see this approach considered in Halliburton and uh, would, would like to ask if um, uh, at some point, is that a, a approach that would be considered for Halliburton? And I think it also speaks to some of the concerns that came up about the administration of, um, 
of the issues that were brought up by previous speakers. And uh, the other couple of questions I've got are in relation to some of the administration effects that um, I think council would have to deal with uh, going forward. Um, our, our current um, um, a cottage, a four season cottage, uh, is actually 100% uh, inside that 30 meter setback that's being proposed. Uh, the front of the cottage is currently 54 feet or um, 16 meters from the high water mark. Um, a few years ago, we wanted to extend the building um, uh, to the side and we had to purchase the shoreline road allowance to be able to get that building permit. Um, so I guess one question that flows from that is, we have people that owned, uh, had to purchase and own the shoreline um, um, uh, road allowance and other people that have not. And how will those people be treated differently um, under these um, uh, proposed bylaws? Um, my last question is um, a sort of a practical example. Uh, as we know, we've uh, unfortunately had a few uh, floods in the last uh, 20 years. Uh, the, probably the worst one was back in 2013. And um, as part of that flood in Minden, um, rightfully so, the dams were all uh, backed up uh, to protect Minden. And the result of that was um, that the lakes upstream of uh, Minden, and we're on Beach Lake, part of the Gull River system, uh, we were had significant flooding on our lake. As a matter of fact, I had over a foot of water on the front of my property, uh, back about uh, 60 meters uh, on, the, on the property. And so I had some significant damage that I needed to repair in terms of the beach and the, uh, and the property. And uh, so the question re that related to that, we're gonna see more of these floods as we go forward. And uh, how, what's the administration uh, gonna be like in terms of um, my ability to protect the property and uh, reclaim um, the condition back uh, to prior to the flood? So uh, just a couple examples, um, maybe speaks to the administration and thanks for the opportunity to ask the questions. Okay, well, thanks for that, Larry. We're not gonna a uh, answer the questions right now. What we're gonna do is we'll kind of go through uh, everyone else on the list and then, but maybe Brent and I can kind of circle back to the questions that you posed at the end, if that's okay with you. That sounds great, thank you. Awesome, thanks, Larry. Um, so next we have Mark Elliott. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Elliott. I'm a property owner on Grace Lake in the township of Dysart et al. I'm speaking on behalf of the Grace Lake Association tonight. Uh, I'm a board member with the association. Uh, we have cottagers and permanent residents uh, on our association and on our board. Uh, we appreciate the uh, work Halliburton County is doing to get input and develop a practical and effective shoreline preservation bylaw. A bylaw is needed urgently. At a property on our lake where weeks ago there was woodland and natural shoreline, there's now a lawn and stripped shoreline. Both of these changes are detrimental to lake health. Harmful runoff from the new lawn now flows directly to the lake. Now, whether or not this is permissible now, it does show what happens without a strong shoreline bylaw. Now, as you prepare the bylaw, we have one request. The bylaw needs to prevent the start of site alterations until a permit has been issued. Once the site is altered, it's very difficult to get restored and requires neighbors to make a complaint. These complaints bring on hard feelings that can last for years. All of this can be avoided if the rules are in plain Eng English, clear, well communicated, including to the landscapers, and prevent site alteration until a permit is issued. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. We appreciate that. So next we're going to go to Deborah Bassler. So can you hear me? Yep, sure can. 
So I just wanted to say a few things, and I think that this meeting has been very helpful and eye-opening um, for all of us. And I completely agree that we need some sort of a shoreline bylaw, but some of the concerns that I have in my family's basically developed part of Cushog Lake and um, the property's been in our family for almost 70 years. So um, I grew up there every summer, all summer long. And I, one of the things I love about the cottage is that deep, clean, cold water. Um, and I agree with the gentleman that just spoke. It's a tragedy that somebody would put in lawn um, you know, on our shorefront. So with that said, some of the things that I think we need to focus on, um, or maybe that should be taken into consideration if they're not, um, are, um, sorry, I just lost my train of thought, are perhaps keeping the shoreline more natural. So if someone is putting in, um, changing or altering a lot for whatever that is, whether it's a new building or, or an addition, or just changing their waterfront, I think there should be some require restrictions on what you can do, how much of a dock you can have. Um, and also in, in replacing, if you're doing anything um, in a small section of your property, putting just a dock in the water that you also add back in some ind indigenous plants. Because one of the biggest buffers that we have to, to protect our lakes is the actual shoreline, not necessarily the property that leads down to the shoreline. Um, and with that, I think another thing that I don't know is in the bylaw at all, but I live on a lake here in the United States and it's a large lake and we're about an hour and a half out of New York City and we do get algae blooms late in, the, in August and it is disappointing. Um, but I do think that we also have a lot of very large wake boats and those are also things that kind of boats that we're seeing in our small lakes in Ontario. And I do think that when somebody's wakeboarding and they've got ballast tanks, and these are big boats to begin with, the waves that they put into the shoreline are also not helping protect our shoreline. So I just wanted to make sure we've done some restrictions here on the lake I live in Connecticut. Um, and I just wanna make sure that that's something that you consider too. So indigenous plants and looking at um, at the size of boats and maybe even restricting the hours that boats can be used just to try and keep some of the traffic down, especially on the weekends. And that's, um, you know, really all I have to say. We definitely need some sort of a bylaw, but I don't know, you know, there's other things maybe we can look at too to help. Thank you. Thank you for that, Deborah. So Mike, maybe we'll bring uh, Sharon Gibson in next, please. Hello, Sharon. Would you mind unmuting yourself? Good evening. Can you hear me? Yep, sure can. Okay. I've been blessed to be able to cottage um, in Halliburton since I was a little girl. And now I'm further blessed to be a permanent resident uh, in the Algonquin Highlands. But you just have to drive along Highway 35 past a number of our lakes. 12 Mile Lake, Boshkong Lake, Halls Lake, and Kushog to see hundreds, perhaps thousands of feet of lake shoreline where non-waterfront property owners have constructed docks, staircases, decks, pump houses, pergolas, et cetera, on the shoreline that this bylaw supposedly uh, aims to protect. They neither, can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can, Sharon. Okay. I'm sorry. Please continue. Okay. Um, they neither own nor do they have a legal right to build on these. In fact, these lands are owned by various levels of government, the municipality and the, prov the province. Would it not be prudent to have these lengths of shoreline re-naturalized by the removal of structures and their restoration first, which is land that you and the Ontario Ministry of Transportation already own and thus have authority over? before you enact further regulations restricting the use of waterfront properties that are legitimately owned by waterfront property owners. It would seem that you are attempting to further legislate waterfront property owners by this bylaw, whilst at the same time turning a blind eye to the construction which has been done and continues to be done on land that you own and that of your provincial counterpart. 
I am aware that a proposal has been made at Council of Algonquin Highlands to license such situations. But again, that seems to be simply an attempt to legitimize an illegal action which has a detrimental effect on the health of the shoreline and thus the lakes, which is the core issue of what we're talking about by the enactment of this new bylaw. In fact, an MTO rep who I spoke to said that every time this issue gets raised, it gets squashed due to the political implications of its enforcement. Just recently, a new dock was constructed on Halls Lake at the end of Buckslide Road on what is clearly MTO owned land. There's only a very few feet, nowhere near 30 meters from the water to the highway. I do not know to whom this belongs, but there have been a number of sales and consequently new builds undertaken along Buckslide Road. Do all of these people have the ability to build docks on the lake without restriction? What about owners on the Kinesis River? Can they construct docks on the shoreline of Elvin Johnson Park or along the Old Mill Road Causeway or other pu publicly owned or municipally or provincially owned land? Waterfront property owners should not be the first target of laws or bylaws to protect the integrity of our lakes. Council should first look at the uses being made of their own shoreline and that of the Ministry of Transportation's and put a stop to the uses of such before they enact further restrictions on property owners who already fall under current building bylaws and permit restrictions. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Sharon. We appreciate hearing that perspective. Mike, if we can go to Russ Wunker, please. Russ will be joining us by phone. Russ, can you push star six to unmute yourself? Thank you very much. I'm sorry I could not hook up to the Zoom. I think my computer's been over Zoom this week, so I'm on a phone. <laughs> Thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Russ Wonker. I have lived at Miners Bay for almost 75 years. I will outline a few of the thoughts and practical suggestions that I submitted to the county in January when I also suggested a cooling off period regarding this bylaw. At the heart of good tourism is good water. My maternal grandfather came here in 1912 and in 1920 was a founder of one of the earliest lake associations in Ontario. A half century later, we amalgamated the two organizations on Gull Lake and I served as president. During that same time, my family operated Miners Bay Lodge for over 80 years, promoting tourism in the Highlands. Thus, there are certainly two sides to the issue, but I believe that there are actually many more. I'm concerned about potential costs and the erosion of private property rights, as well as the somewhat selective approach to solutions, as was outlined in the previous proposal. Any legislation should openly address added staffing, increased costs and taxes, as well as realistic cost benefit analysis. Also, there is more to lake health than just shoreline regulations. If we are really serious about water quality, why not proper monitoring of ice fishing? Most ice fishermen are not local, and sometimes up to 100 huts can be in a single lake with no porta potties in view. And if the overnight parking that blocks our township roads is any indication, a lot of overnight stays. Certainly, the filth, garbage, and debris left on the ice and drifting ashore in the spring tells the tale. With COVID, the number of offenders last winter was reduced, and thankfully, huge cottage like structures of prior years that house large groups of individuals with no monitoring were not here. But where is the regulation and concerns about this pollution to our lakes? I'm also concerned about the us and them mentality that can develop between those who have secured their spot in the sun and the onerous regulations that they never had to deal with that they are willing to impose on others. Was the purpose of grandfathering really to allow bulk gas tanks near the shore for some and fertilized lawns right to the lake edge for others? Why not a policy of incentives for partial rehabilitation of existing properties? This could be encouraged and achieved by providing credits towards the county portion of the tax levy. Similarly, is it really logical or fair to allow owners of existing property to replace a traditional cottage 
with a several thousand square foot mansion with no surcharge for the huge modification to the original footprint and the subsequent impact on the lake. We all know stories of cottage owners who, as an example, have instructed their builders to get around existing regulations regarding wetlands, for example, and simply laugh at the fines that were being part of the cost. Deliberate breaking the law should have serious consequences. No, I'm certainly not suggesting more intrusion into private property rights, but rather better and more equitable application of common sense regulations. On that point, to be specific, I do not believe that the proposed regulations on the movement of materials within a piece of private property are legitimate unless they affect a specific wetland or shore entity. Being practical, let's find a realistic solution to the exclusive population of geese that foul our waters and shorelines everywhere. As well, multiple impersonal rentals to large groups of party goers with no vested interest in our community overtaxes septic systems created and approved for single families and no doubt adversely affect water quality more than cutting a tree 80 feet from the water. In short, let's look at all the factors affecting water quality and take concerted action on many fronts rather than just presenting the bill to new builds. There needs to be better coordination between existing agency stakeholders and interested parties, such as the county and municipal governments, MNR, the OPP, Canada Ontario Rideau Trent System, Ministry of Environment, and Parks Canada, in order to seek solutions to problems with shared or overlapping jurisdictions. Bureaucrats should not have the ultimate say over the interpretation of whatever specifics may eventuate in a bylaw. This bylaw should not be the thin edge of the wedge into exerting unlimited and unwarranted intrusion into private rights. Perhaps a standing county committee that represents all interested parties might best adjudicate and resolve issues that arise locally going forward. I trust that these comments and suggestions will be considered as the new bylaws develop. Thank you for your efforts. Thank you very much, Russ. Mike, if we can let uh, Carolyn Langdon in, please. Carolyn is not on the call, so I will okay. bring in uh, Deborah Bennett. Thank you. Sorry, just one more moment, please. It's possible Deborah may have disconnected. Should I move to the next person? Yes, why don't we uh, bring Jim Hodden in and then if Deb comes back, Mike, we can circle back to her. Hi, can you hear me? We can hear you fine, Jim. I thank you for allowing me to join the meeting tonight. My name is Jim Hadwin, and I uh, own a property on South Lake in Minden. I haven't got a lot to say tonight, and uh, I'm neither for or against the bylaw, although I do feel that 30 meters is a long ways, um, or it, I guess I should say that I think it's a little bit um, large amount of space to be uh, protected. Um, one of my reasons for this is I'm wondering what will happen to me in the future when uh, some of my buildings are actually on the shore road allowance within the 66 foot um, shore mm -hmm. road allowance. The biggest uh, thing that I have a concern with is putting bylaws in place. It's the same as a speed limit. It's the same as a policy or anything like that. If it cannot be enforced, then why put it in? And the reason I say that is I've been dealing with an issue in Minden Township now with the bylaw department, which is in direct violation of their policy in 2006 for shoreline docks which also states that they, uh, any dock put in after 2006 has to have a joint liability insurance policy on it, which I am certain that it does not. It's been over a year and the bylaw has done nothing about it. I've made 
so many calls I could give you every which one I did about it. And I just don't see why we don't clean up the bylaws we have in place before implementing more. It's not just the shoreline that puts pressure on the lakes. It's other factors as well. And a big one over here is a trailer park. Since COVID started, South Lake Trailer Park has doubled in occupancy. If that doesn't put pressure on the lake and the environment, then what does? So I would just like to see some consideration put into current bylaws before we implement new ones. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Mike, if we can, uh, if Deb is available, maybe we can bring her in. Otherwise, uh, maybe we can move to Glenn Stone. Deb is not on the call, so I'll be bringing in Glenn Stone. Thank you. Hello, Glenn. Could you unmute your mic, please? Is that okay? That is Perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, my name is Glenn Stone, and I welcome you all to uh, what you're trying to do for the lakes uh, in Minden Township. I live in Horseshoe Lake, and I've seen a lot of um, residents that don't live on the lake, they rent and whatnot, and they come in and they do cut down trees. And I have raised this uh, concern to the council and I never get any feedback from them. Never get an email, never get a phone number or uh, reply or anything. So how, how is this gonna be enforced? Uh, that's what I would like to know. And uh, I'm all for um, water quality. And I consider our lake very, very well. Um, uh, in quality of water quality, but um, I think 30 meters is a little um, much of a setback. I would go maybe, uh, you know, 15 meters or 18 meters. Um, I plant a lot of trees on my property and uh, I, I always keep on planting and I don't use any fertilizer, but I see a lot of people doing this and they're not stopped, nothing's done. So I would just like to see how this is gonna be implemented and uh, regulated. Thank you. Thank you for that, Glenn. So Mike, we'll bring in Tace uh, Wakefield next, please. Hello, Tace. Could you please unmute your microphone? There. Hi. Hi, folks. Good evening, councillors, staff, and consultants. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this evening. I own property on Little Kinesis Lake in Dysart. I'm working with the owners of 20 properties on the Kinesis Lakes who are concerned that the previous shoreline preservation bylaw as drafted will not achieve the objectives that were set out in the preamble and do nothing to renaturalize the shoreline on the lakes in Halliburton County that fall below the 75% considered positive for lake health, but will seriously diminish the property rights of owners and add to the burden for taxpayers. Uh, we've provided a written submission to the consultants in the past week and uh, we'll be adding uh, an addendum to that. Um, I don't have enough time tonight to talk to uh, all of our analysis. Um, so I'm gonna focus on our recommendations um, I will talk about uh, some of the what and some of the how that the consultants mentioned in the start. Um, and I will reference the prior draft um, in, in some instances because I think it provides a good straw man of some of the issues. So our first recommendation is with respect to effective consultation and communication. 
there is lots of controversy about this proposed bylaw and a fair bit of its misinformation, um, but we have yet to see a clear statement of what new obligations will be created, what property rights will be retained or lost, how this wor will work with bylaws already in place at the upper and lower tier, et cetera. Once this consultation is completed and a new approach is identified, we recommend that the lower tier municipalities send a summary document to all waterfront property owners in their next mailing uh, before a new, new draft proceeds. That way all taxpayers can understand what is being provide, uh, proposed and provide thoughtful input. Turning to the policy issues in 2019, the Council of Halliburton Property Owners Association published the Lake Health Report. Um, one of the previous speakers, uh, speakers referenced this. Uh, it assessed the natural and regenerated vegetation levels on 59 or roughly half of the Halliburton lakes, including most of the larger ones. In aggregate, this study showed that 38% of the lake properties assessed had natural and regenerated shorelines above the 75% goal of the bylaw. About 30% were close in the 70 to 75% range and only 33% fell below the 70% level. We note that most of these lakes were fully developed decades ago and many have few empty lots remaining. For the large proportion of lakes which are near or above the objectives of the bylaw, such as Kinesis, establishing a 30 meter no-go zone represents an unwarranted reduction in property light rights where there is no acute problem to address. Accordingly, we recommend that for those lakes that are above 75% in terms of shoreline vegetation and where over 75% of the lots are already developed, the shoreline preservation setback be set at 10 meters only. We also note that the present uh, or prior draft only allowed a five meter pathway, whether the water frontage of the lot is 90 feet or 1500 feet. This is unfair to owners of large lake frontages who pay high property taxes based on their water frontage, but would effectively be denied the opportunity to enjoy this frontage. We recommend that a pathway exemption be expressed as a percent of the lot water frontage, uh, not a, a set uh, meterage, and recommend on the over 75 lakes um, that I previously mentioned, it be set at 20% and no permit re required to go up to this level. On the other side, we recommend that there are a third of the lakes that are below 70% shoreline vegetation. And on these, we think much greater action is required to restore the uh, the shoreline. Uh, we don't think this will happen under the previous draft. We don't support requiring property owners to renaturalize the properties. However, there are a number of measures which the municipalities could pursue to encourage property owners to renaturalize, including public education on the merits, establishing low cost plant banks like food banks where property owners could source native species to replant and or putting in place tax incentives for property owners who exceed the quantified objectives in the bylaw. In terms of water quality, the single greatest threat in Hall Halliburton County is improperly functioning septic tanks. The recent inspection program on Kinesis showed that over a quarter of all systems failed with many of these failures being recently installed systems. Clearly this shows that a full pump out septic inspection program should be the first priority to protect our water. But regrettably, the lower tier municipalities have passed watered down or completely ineffective septic inspection requirements. We recommend that the first priority for Halliburton County Council should be to put in place a full pump out septic inspection program. If done at the upper tier level, this would enable the resources to be focused first on the lakes where testing shows water quality at greatest risk. The next set of concerns we have is with the legislative authority to be used. The Planning Act governs land use issues in Ontario. What I can and can't do on the first 100 feet of my property is a land use issue. Part 5, Section 34, 3.2 empowers municipalities to pass bylaws, quote, for prohibiting any use of land that is a significant shoreline of a lake, river, or stream, end quote, directly on point for a shoreline preservation bylaw. However, the proposed bylaw used the Municipal Act as its legislative authority. The Municipal Act does authorize municipalities excuse me, to pass bylaws regarding tree cutting and site alteration, and for general economic, social, and environmental well-being, 
but it does not specifically enable municipalities to pass bylaws specifically regarding shorelines. As such, we believe it may not be the proper legislative authority. So why does this matter? The Planning Act explicitly grandfathers properties when a bylaw is changed so that property owners cannot be deprived of prior property rights. The Planning Act has also established an effective process for appeal of bad decisions through the Ontario Municipal Board. Accordingly, our next recommendation is for Halliburton County to obtain and publish an independent legal opinion on which is the appropriate legal authority to use, recognizing the issues of the protection of previously existing property rights and the need for an appeal process. Our next concern is with duplication of effort. Right now, the lower tier municipality has a lead on most permitting issues affecting alterations to private property. They already have the staff and the expertise. One positive aspect of the prior draft that we would like to see continued in any future draft is the exemption for tree cutting or site alteration pursuant to a building permit issued by a lower tier. This must continue to be included in future drafts to ensure that property owners don't get caught between two overlapping processes and two overlapping ju uh, jurisdictions with the risk that one says yes and the other says no. cutting in the 100 foot no go process criteria and conditions for such variances and what the rights of a appeal will be were not spelled out. We're uncomfortable with this lack of specificity, degree of discretion, and recommend draft when variances will be allowed, who will be empowered to make these decisions, what is the process to apply, and what will be the rights of appeal in any future bylaw. I note that there are already a panel of legal requirements, the federal, provincial, upper, and lowest this evening. Some appear to be well enforced, others less so. We urge, first of all, that there be full enforcement of the existing requirements before new layers of regulation are added. If Halliburton Council does proceed with the shorelines, both scrub their current regulations of all duplication. So this includes the shoreline vegetation buffer in Dysart zoning bylaw and in other lower tiers, uh, the county's existing tree cutting bylaws, et cetera. In conclusion, waterfront property owners pay 70% of the property tax revenues in our area, but see little for our dollars. And who is like, uh, but identifying and putting in place those public policy measures that will actually achieve the desired objectives efficiently and effectively as possible while respecting property. Consider the recommendations we put before you tonight. Thank you very much, Tace. We appreciate that. So, uh, Mike, I think Carolyn um, Langdon has joined the call. Has she not? She has, and I will. I will bring her in. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Are you? Yep, yeah, we can hear you now, Carolyn. I'm, I'm here, but you can't see me. Is that okay? <laughs> That's fine by us. Well, I can't. Uh, I can't see where I can turn on my video. It should be if you're joined via the web browser. It should be down in the lower left-hand corner of your screen. If you hover above the bottom of the screen, it will automatically pop up. Okay. Oh, there we go. I had the same issue earlier. Yeah, there we go. There. We go. Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience. And we're well into the uh, second hour, um, but I have been listening very attentively. Um, I grew up in Halliburton and I did all my schooling here in Halliburton County and I have explored over the years many of its forests and waterways. I'm a member of uh, Plant Savers or Plant Savers United of North America. I'm a master gardener of Halliburton County 
I'm the director of Wild Edibles Halliburton, an, org an organization that educates on the culinary and medicinal value of native plants. And in doing so, um, we come to respect the history and the ways of indigenous peoples that once occupied our, our beautiful highlands. We are privileged to live in the Halibur Highlands and with that comes a responsibility to those downstream. So while we can talk about water quality for our own personal recreational uses, we are on the upper levels of the watershed and the water that leaves Halliburton County goes somewhere. And that goes to other communities downstream of us. And that goes to communities that don't have the privilege to live in a beautiful recreational area like we do. Um, it just a, a couple of facts. In Halliburton County, we have 83% natural cover, and that includes our wetlands. Um, in Southern Ontario, natural cover is now 3%. It is, it's an abysmal 3%, but that 83% is what I would like, what I like to say is local abundance in a world of global scarcity. So we are really an island, a forested island of relatively clean lakes, but we are a tiny island in a world of global scarcity. So I just want to underscore that when we look at what these bylaws are. So of course, I'm in support of a bylaw that would protect our native, uh, our native um, vegetation. 30 meters is merely a good start. It is not it is the minimum that is recommended by scientists and and it's 30 meters from from a waterway so protecting our forests in Halliburton County or is also uh, is is a global imperative so just to put it in that context what we're talking about in terms of this bylaw um, it's really a, it's a very small gesture that we're making for a very large problem um, so I could speak about the many reasons why native vegetation is helpful for our water quality, but what I want to do instead, and other people um, tonight have done that very knowledgeably and eloquently. So what I'd like to do is share with you a very recent, but very positive experience. As a master gardener, we are called on to do uh, garden consultations for property owners and um, so this week we were asked to come and consult for a very large property on the newly developing side, east side of Halliburton Lake. This was a very large property, probably about three acres. It was a multi-million dollar property with a sprawling timber frame seasonal residence, and it was just newly built. So this bylaw would in future speak to this type of development that's happening in, happening in our county. Um, the site was low and required uh, over four years, the uh, property owner brought in truckload after truckload of fill, so tons of fill, and it was extensively graded. The, um, the, uh, the lovely timber frame home was built um, it's still being finished. It's a few few months from being finished. And the owners, to their credit, kept all of the trees on the waterfront. And they have since brought in new trees to frame the house and property. Um, we were brought in, the Halbert County Master Gardeners, to advise them on shrub and perennial plant choices close to the new house. So of the six shrub varieties that they had uh, chosen and gone out and purchased, only one was, was a native plant and that was the red osier dogwood. So three hours later at this garden consultation, we'll fast forward. We've had a full tour of the property, including the, uh, the extensive waterfront uh, frontage. And so while we were walking along the waterfront, I spotted wild blueberries, bunchberry, wintergreen, straight maple, among many other wild native plants that had escaped the, uh, the bulldozer. 
So I pointed it out to them and they were absolutely, these people were absolutely thrilled and they didn't know what these plants were. So this is such a good, the ending is very good. So these people, their intention, they come from Vaughan. There, there's, uh, this cottage will house three generations. Um, and they, they, they are aware of the beauty around them. They had cottaged a little bit on the other side of Halliburton Lake, but they didn't really see their property in context of the whole Halliburton County and their surrounding forests. And I kind of joked with, with Tav, uh, the, the owner, and I um, said, you know, if you were up in an airplane looking down and if you want to trans transfer all of your property into grass, you would be spending the rest of your life digging up dandelions and trying to preserve your little tiny patch of grass in this overwhelming wilderness. Um, and is that good use of your time? You have children and you have grandchildren. Is that what you want to be doing? And that's not what he wants to do. So in three hours, that one garden consultation, he went from, they went from he and his wife, homeowners, grandparents, with their initial intention was to put sod or, gra or grass seed down on their entire waterfront property and on the back property. And instead we convinced them to let those native plants that were already there with some mulch, let them regenerate and grow back into the disturbed area. They're gonna mulch heavily. And then with some judicious plantings of native plantings of which we'll supply them a list and some suppliers. They, they embraced that and they told us, they shared with us that their grandchildren are very interested in learning about native flora and fauna and they're going to forest school. So these grandparents now are absolutely thrilled that they can provide their grandchildren a learning opportunity in their backyard and they don't have to send them somewhere else to learn about nature. Um, they also had a, a low lying area that um, I pointed out the bulrushes that again had escaped the, um, the bulldozer. And they are now going to leave that low lying area and they're gonna put in some marsh marigolds, some native cardinal flower, and they're going to make that a, an aesthetic addition using nature and adding more native plants. Um, they're going to put a wildflower garden uh, as an alternative to grass over top of their septic bed. And they very much like the idea that they didn't have to uh, cut grass and that they could just go out and have a cut flower garden. They're also going to use eco lawn seed where they do, where they still want a little bit of grass for their grandchildren to play on. Um, and an eco lawn seed is made up of uh, slow growing native grasses. So there are alternatives out there. And, um, you know, we also brought up the issue of, of geese and geese are not native to Halliburton County, believe it or not. I know we have a lot of geese, but they're not native to here. They're native to the tundra areas of Northern Canada, including, and Alaska. Um, and I just sort of, I want to end by, um, you know, these children, they're going to have an opportunity to run across a soft carpet of red pine needles instead of grass and an overly manicured forest area where the, the pine needles are raked. So these children are going to be able to experience that and have a campfire in a natural setting instead of a hardscaped uh, paved area down by the waterfront. And my last, my last comment is but that by preserving and expanding their native vegetation, these owners or what I would like to say, the stewards of the land are gaining everything and losing nothing. They only needed to see and value what they already have. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Carolyn, for that perspective and for the story as well. I appreciate that. So Mike, maybe we'll go to Ken Fisher next, please.
There we I go. Can. Hi there. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you, uh, everybody. And uh, huge thanks to Halliburton Council. Uh, um, having this meeting is, is a testimony to your, your passion for our environment, but it's also a, a testimony to your courage uh, to relook at, at something that wasn't working. And I think that's, that's a, a huge congratulations on my part. That's a massive step. A lot of what I'm gonna say has already been said, uh, issues of global warming uh, uh, that we know is affecting the lakes no matter what we do. Uh, it seems to me that that means then uh, that what devolves to us as uh, cottagers, and I'm a 60 year cottager on Boshkong Lake and a, uh, that uh, um, would devolve to us as things that we have immediate control of. And, and many of those would mention, and I'd like to reiterate mentioning of them, the lawn issue with its nutrients, and uh, we don't have much agriculture to worry about uh, in, in uh, Halliburton, unfortunately, but uh, uh, that's a, 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 a huge obvious source uh, of uh, Pollution. Number of authors and people have talked about have talked about septic systems, and I would I would strongly uh, uh, support anything that is done to uh, to monitor and and look at the septic systems. On uh, Algonquin Highlands, did did a, a survey with a company uh, what, last year, I think it was, and and I know of three systems that, uh, in my neighborhood. Uh, that should have failed, but weren't even uh, were passed uh, without any uh, any any looking. Uh, so I think that's a, a, a massive opportunity for the uh, for the uh, um, the county. To the consultants, uh, I was thrilled beyond belief to see you starting off with science. I'm a scientist by by trade, and and uh, good solid peer reviewed science. Uh, get rid of the hyperbole and, and the, the diagrams. Uh, uh, data and facts will, will provide validity to what, uh, whatever we decide to do. And, and obviously we do need to decide to, to do something. Uh, and uh, one of the, uh, what we're actually, I think, talking about is, is a balancing act of mitigation. And we have ideals uh, uh, that we have to mitigate against the practical and, and enforceable. Uh, with all due respect to the 30 meter setback, I have two undeveloped lots. Uh, 30 meters is a bush lot. Uh, if you take the 30 meter setback, add a 15 meter swath down to the lake and 25% of the, of the lake front allowed to be developed for whatever reason, docks and structures. I'm not sure that we've moved further ahead than, than, uh, than a 10 meter quality riparian zone. Uh, I'd be interested for the, uh, the consultants to, to actually try to come to grips with that kind of a, a, a balancing act. Um, we are, I think, because of global warming and population growth into a period of massive, uh, it's like, like the corporate culture of cottagers has got to change. Uh, because if we don't change and don't do things better, then we will run into trouble uh, uh, no matter what. Um, and then lastly, I'd like to, uh, some of uh, the, Mr. Wonker from Miners Bay uh, alluded to the point that I wanted to leave you with is that we've been talking about a, a shoreline bylaw uh, in a variety of format, but the preamble is always what we're really talking about is lake water quality or, or water quality. So what if we actually called the bylaw lake water quality and actually uh, made shoreline protection part of it but the rest of the shoreline protection is some number of people uh, have alluded to has MNR, has public health, uh, a number of different agencies, uh, government silos that really need to come together to, to create something that's workable and, and enforceable. And, and uh, I would leave you with that, uh, that challenge that uh, that if we just look at silos, we're not dealing with the whole the whole problem and whole issue. Uh, sorry, if we, what did I say? If we just look at shorelines, we we aren't looking at the at the entire picture. Uh, uh, 
So thanks again for listening. Particularly the science people, I love your approach. Thanks very much. Thank you, Ken. We appreciate that. Mike, if we can invite Carson McDonald to join the conversation, please. Hello, Carson. Would you mind? There you go. Is my uh, there? Can you hear me now? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear, Carson. Oh, thanks. Uh, so, hi, uh, my name is Carson McDonald. I'm the owner of the Doc Shop. Uh, we're in Halberton. Uh, we've been in business for 10 years. Uh, we pride ourselves on, on uh, trying to create environmentally friendly uh, dock solution or marine facilities. Uh, we also do a lot of uh, shoreline restoration uh, as well as uh, dock stacks and shoreline structures. Um, my uh, wh one of the things I, I notice when 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 I go to a shoreline is uh, every shoreline is different. Every customer's uh, needs are different. Every uh, every lake is different. Every every lake has different you know water qualities, uh, water features. Uh, you know, some are full of bedrock, some are full of, you know, vegetation. Uh, you know, we're, we try to come up with, uh, you know, the, the most practical uh, solution for our customers. Uh, my concern with the, with this shoreline uh, bylaw is it's not, a, it's, it's a one size fits all bylaw, but it can't address the countless variables that we encounter daily. Um, we, and, and, and when you have to change plans as a contractor, we can't wait for an inspector to come out, uh, look at, look at the, the situation and give us their recommendation uh, when, when, you know, they're, they're not experts in the field. They're, you know, whoever. Uh, they, by, by having to change, having to wait and change plans is going to, it's going to cost me money, cost the customer money. Eventually, customers, contractors that want to do the right thing will stop, and they just won't do it anymore. They they won't they won't ask permission, and and like a lot of them do already, is is it's a lot easier for them to ask forgiveness than ask permission, uh, which I feel is how most of our bylaws are written at the moment. Uh, is, is uh, you know, you do it and if you get caught, then you pay the fine. Otherwise, you know, you, you get away with it. Uh, one of the solutions that I, I, would, I would recommend for this is to hold the contractors responsible, not only the property owners. A lot of these, a lot of these shorelines that are getting cleared aren't entirely the, the property owners themselves doing the work. It's, it's them having a contractor come in and say, we want you to take all of these trees out so we can see the lake. And the contractor says, for sure, yeah, we'll do that. Um, yeah, so, so holding the contractors responsible, I think you'll, you'll see a, a lot more responsible uh, land altering and construction going on. Um, one, one of the ways I was thinking you could, you could hold contractors responsible as well as promote development and uh, promote small businesses in Halliburton is create a, a, a board or a panel of approved municipality approved uh, or, or county approved contractors. And, and if people want to do developments uh, or clear land or land alterations or landscape, uh, they choose from one of the the approved contractors. Um, so that uh, yeah, that's one of my my solutions for the the contractors. Uh, the other the other uh, key issue that that I think with this bylaw is the pressure is being put on the property owners, the cottage owners, which is with without a doubt there needs to be there needs to be something uh i think that the 
tree bylaw is is great. You know, it holds people accountable. Uh, the shoreline bylaw, I think, it needs a lot of work done to it um, to uh, to sort of answer some questions, answer uh, you know some of the issues. Um, but uh, but the cottage owners aren't entirely responsible for the lake health. I think the municipality needs and, and county need to uh, accept some responsibility when uh, when shoreline that when the unnaturalized shoreline accounts for a portion of the sediment that that flows into the water, uh, a much greater uh, contributor to the sediment and the pollutants that are ending up in our lakes is actually uh, from road salts and and uh, the chemicals that we use on our on our highways and our roads. A lot of which ends up downstream in our lakes. Uh, so so that's that's a much bigger contributor to the health of our lake or the, the uh, sorry I guess the unhealthiness of our lake. Um, so yeah, I think I think municipality and county need to uh, address that when there are so many uh, provinces and counties in, uh, in Ontario and and Canada that have banned road salts. There are alternatives; they are more expensive, but eventually we're gonna we're gonna be moving to like when you look at all the other provinces that aren't using road salts. Ontario is, is going to follow eventually, and I think it would be a great decision for the county and municipality to uh, be the first to step up and say, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll use alternatives. Um, the other thing, being a dock builder, I see a lot of, a lot of docks, a lot of shorelines. Uh, we see a lot of lakes. Um, one of the biggest contributors to uh, the, the pollution that ends up in the lakes is docks. I mean, it, it's, it's sad to say, but I mean, I'm sure every cottage owner, every property owner at some point or another has seen the, the derelict docks or uh, the abandoned docks, uh, the styrofoam uh, that ends up in the lakes. Uh, the municipality, I believe, and county have the uh, ability to uh, to ban the type of materials that are ending up in our lakes, one of which is the blue styrofoam, which is by far the biggest uh, contributor, in, in my opinion, uh, for the physical pollution that is ending up in our lakes. Uh, if, if you look at Georgian Bay, Georgian Bay has actually banned the use of blue styrofoam or styrofoam uh, floats under their docks. Um, and, and, you know, that's great. That's what needs to happen. Uh, if we want to prevent this, another, another, uh, solution for, uh, derelict docks and, and abandoned docks would be dock registration. Part of this bylaw could encompass a dock registration. And if people were to, uh, to, uh, have to put their, uh, 901 number on, on their docks, uh, you know, a, a permanent 911 number on their dock, then that would be attached to theirs and there'd be no way that they could, or be difficult for them to abandon it and, uh, and go get a new one. Because in today's society, that's what people do. I see it all the time. Um, and, and we remove a lot of docks. Uh, every, every dock that we sell, we, uh, we ask, what are you doing with that dock? Uh, we'll remove it for you. Um, if they plan to do something else with it, then, then that's on them. Um, but uh, but that, that's what we try to do anyway. Um, so yeah, dock registration, I think would be a great thing as well as uh, providing some other benefits as well. Uh, you know, location for, for uh, cottagers uh, or visitors on the lake, as well as a location for uh, emergency services, which I'm also on uh, the volunteer fire department. And we have found it difficult in the past to find certain properties um, because there's no 911 numbers on on the waters on the water edge. So uh, yeah, that, that's a few a few issues uh, that I have uh, with the bylaw and a few solutions. Um, 
yeah, I hope, uh, I hope that's helpful. <laughs> and uh, thanks for listening to me. <laughs> no, listen, thank you, Carson. I, I appreciate hearing your perspective on this. So thanks for joining us tonight. No problem. Talk to you later. Mike, can we uh, bring in Tony Saunders, please? Uh, Tony Saunders is not on the call, so I will bring in Dave Howe. Hello, Dave. It looks like you may have joined both by Zoom and by phone. Do you want to unmute one or the other, please? Hello, David. Would you be able to unmute your mic? You gotta love technology, right? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, are you hearing me okay? Loud and clear, Dave. All right, perfect. I'm a lifelong uh, cottager here on Davis Lake in Minden Hills. Um, my seventh decade here. And I'm fourth generation on the uh, the properties that we own here on Davis Lake. Uh, my maternal ancestors uh, settled in Kinmount in the um, later 1800s and acquired uh, property here and uh, set up a uh, fishing camp and cottage and so forth. And uh, I'm a, a, a descendant of that uh, process. Um, so I've got a lot of history here on the lake. I've got a lot of history in the area, and I know a lot of things uh, about nature and uh, our surrounding area. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk to about tonight was uh, the bylaw basically is front of the cottage focused. And I want to focus more on the back of the cottage and all of the land and all of the ponds and all of the wetlands and everything that we have that uh, is in behind us. Massive ponding, massive swamps, massive uh, warm water, as re was re referenced earlier in the uh, in the introduction. Very poor water quality. I asked my six grandkids. I said, "How many of you would like to go swimming today in a beaver pond?" And I didn't get any yeses. <laughs> and they all know, going from age four to age sixteen, that that's not a good idea. <laughs> And of course, I wouldn't push them to do that. Um, I have a map from 1969 of Davis Lake. It's an actual aerial photo taken by Lands and Forest. And it shows some of the property around the, the lake and some of the ponds. I also pulled a, uh, something off the county website, uh, a more modern version, uh, I guess, uh, Google uh, Maps or Google Earth. And it shows a much broader area. And I was specifically looking at uh, our watershed and how many ponds are in the watershed. Um, I've heard that we've had, we have 500 lakes in Halliburton. We have 600 lakes. Tonight I heard we have almost a thousand. Um, I'm not sure whether they're all deemed as lakes or some of that thousand would be considered as beaver ponds. Um, I don't have to tell council that the ponding is a problem because beaver dams are not uh, uh, forever and they break and create tremendous damage on the roads and uh, bring in very bad water surges to the lakes. These ponds are breeding grounds for bacteria and algae blooms and many other things. It's like a toilet flush comes into our lake. Our recent rains, we had obviously considerable rain a couple of two or three weeks ago and long the water rose here on Davis Lake. We're a landlocked lake. We have about seven streams that come in and only one that leaves. And even with the one leaving growing ex exponentially as the water rose uh, for the exit, 
our water kept rising well after the rains had stopped because the beaver ponds were releasing and letting in tremendous amount of uh, undesirable water. Um, in fact, I think our lake level was probably the highest it's ever been for July. I've seen it this high in the early spring, but never, never in July. Um, so I don't support the, de the basically uh, de facto stealth expropriation of our shoreland to achieve it. Um, I, I definitely favor clean air and clean water. Um, I think the cottager issue is much overstated. And I think the bylaw is premature, it's misguided and, and special interest driven and will not achieve the desired result because of these other influences of bad water coming in. And I suspect Davis Lake is not alone. I think uh, all of those ponds go somewhere. They all go into different lakes and we don't really know anything about them. I know our lake tests the water. I don't think we've ever tested any ponds. By my calculation on our watershed, we have over 50 beaver ponds coming in. And um, that's a massive amount, especially if they, all those dams were to break at the same time. Um, I think another ignored problem in, in all of this is the increasing natural fertilization into our lakes. And I stress natural. Um, surprise, this is not from the lawns. It comes from something that we all know and hate in the spring, tree pollen. Many of us have allergies. And of course we suffer badly from the tree pollen. Tree pollen is actually a fertilizer. And it's at nature's probably biggest fertilizer. It spreads everywhere. Pine tree pollen in particular is, is especially bad. And the, you, we see the yellow rings, yellow green rings around our lakes in the early spring mid and later spring when the pollen is dropped. And uh, even along the shore, it, uh, it puddles, coagulates, gels, and so on. So essentially the, the pine pollen is getting into the lakes and it's a fertilization. Just as a lot of people fertilize their lawns in the spring, nature fertilizes everything with the pine pollen. Nothing we can do about that. And uh, the idea of planting more trees on the shoreline, <laughs> that might give us a uh, pause. Um, we also have international fertilizer inputs, um, which we don't really hear too much about. But these have dated back to the ice ages uh, where they found, uh, for example, Sahara dust in ice core samples in Greenland that date back thousands of years. Um, are you aware that desert dust from windstorms and hurricanes and typhoons is also a natural global fertilization source? Iron rich desert sands have been monitored and known to reach Canada. In fact, Canada has even set up monitoring stations in, uh, on the coast to see what the levels are of the uh, fertilizers that are coming in from the, the dust storms. Um, we've heard dust storms in China just recently. We've heard about it in uh, Utah just recently. The ones in the Sahara Desert are especially bad. Um, they come in with the, uh, the hurricanes and so on. Um, algae, by the way, loves iron. That's another finding I had. Um, again, nothing to do with cottagers, but we are being fed this type of uh, complication into our lives. Another aspect is, hopefully you'll like this one. We, it's something we can do. Real meaningful data is really lacking as far as I can see in Halliburton. We don't know how much rainfall we get, or if we do, nobody seems to be publishing it. Um, we are not measuring all the critically important input metrics to our lake and water environment. Several issues. We need a detailed review of all ponds and their water quality issues. The count and location can be compared to the aerial surveillance photos taken in 1969 by Lands and Forests, if someone wants to dig into the 
archives and compare it to today's satellite imagery. We have new ponds. We have larger ponds. What's happened in the beaver trade, as you well know, would be the uh, fact that beaver pelts are no longer fashionable items. So what's the purpose of trapping beavers? If the beaver harvesters cannot sell their pelts or can't sell them for very much money, what incentive is there for them to trap beavers? So if beavers in Halliburton are allowed to prosper, one of the other things I've learned is that beavers, the young, only stay with the parents for a year or two and then they get kicked out. So they either have to go downstream into our, some of our lakes, which they often do become a problem right in our own lakes, or they go upstream and create ponds of their own, uh, which is also a problem. More ponds means more water flow. More, more warm water means more, more algae in that water when it comes into our lakes. Combined with the beaver excrement and other factors, we have a very bad sewer flush coming into our waters. Nothing to do with cottagers. We need a weather station tracking monitoring system throughout the county. These are digitalized. Farmers have them. My son-in-law has one on his farm. Uh, I don't think he has one quite as elaborate as what we could obviously do here in Halliburton. These are portable monitoring stations. They can be set up to track everything on, on the computers and on the smartphones. All data is uh, archived and uh, available and uh, it can be summarized, grouped and so on. These are very popular in the United States. Pretty much every major university has one of these. Um, these are very important for, for uh, big events like football games and stadiums and so on. These universities don't take chances with the, uh, you know, the weather services in the US because they want a precise um, reading of, of their particular location. These also track everything, the amount of rainfall on any given day, the amount of rainfall cumulatively, and so on. Um, we need real point of time data on rainfall and snow. The more rain, the more beaver dam stressors, the more dam bursts and the more infected bad swamp water coming into our lakes and onto our cottage shores. So Dave, maybe if, if I can just pause right there, I'm just curious to understand how many points um, you have remaining to make. I'm just trying to be mindful of time and the fact that we have a few other folks that are have been yeah. waiting just as patiently as you and they're hoping to speak as well. Well, the good news, I'm on my last point. <laughs> okay. Uh, my last point, and hopefully you'll, you'll like this one too, is remote sensing satellites. How many of you are aware that uh, remote sensing satellites track things like water quality. And they've been doing so for 20 years in the United States. Um, the state of Minnesota, which has over 10,000 lakes, is, uses the remote sensing satellite system. They do it through the University of Minnesota and they track lake by lake water clarity. So if they, if they identify, a, say a hot spot a cloudy spot, they can then activate a local team to go in and investigate. Um, the idea of doing all these little samples and everything else is, is very cute, uh, but uh, there's better ways to do it in the 21st century. And uh, why not take advantage of uh, this technology? This satellite, for example, is also being used in the Great Lakes. And guess who's part partnered with it? Climate Change Environment Canada. So we have precedent on that as well. So leverage the existing technology, get into the 21st century with weather monitoring and um, look at what's going on behind us, not just what's going on in front of us on our lakes and we'll all be better off. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dave, really appreciate that. So Mike, if we can go to Anne-Marie Nasser next, please. Neither Anne Marie Nasser or Donna Santri are on the line, so okay. I want to uh, carry the seat. Hello, can you hear me? Can 
can hear you loud and clear, Harry. Great. Um, yes, I'm a, a cottage owner um, in, in Dysart. I've, I've listened to a lot of the uh, presentations tonight. They've been very interesting. Um, I also uh, have been participating or listening in on the uh, previous meetings, uh, a meeting that was held, I think it was back in February. Um, I think that um, I, I'm generally in agreement with the objectives of the uh, shoreline preservation bylaw. I mean, to go around, uh, you know, the lakes, you'll see these, uh, you know, nice broad lawns occasionally with uh, retaining walls, uh, you know, where the shoreline has been uh, completely denaturalized. And I guess this process occurred, you know, back in the 60s and 70s when there weren't uh, a lot of regulations uh, or whatever in place. But I think the current bylaw um, goes a bit too far in trying to address or, or to redress uh, some of these past uh, past wrongs. I think we've got sufficient protections in place uh, in the current day uh, for the shorelines that we do have. You know, we've got a very rigorous and, and stringent building permit uh, system. Uh, we've gone through, we started to go through the septic inspection process on a number of lakes, which is a source, uh, you know, in the, uh, I guess, improper or not functioning properly septic systems uh, contribute to poor water quality. We've got a good tree preservation uh, bylaw um, so I think there's already enough controls in place without adding in yet another layer um, of, 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 of bylaw. Um, now having said that, um, you know, the 30 meter uh, deep zone from the lakeshore, I think is a little excessive. I mean, first of all, don't get me wrong. I, I don't think we need this, this, this bylaw, but even the, the 30 meters is, 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 is too deep. And I've heard some suggestions earlier on this evening to limit that to 10 meters. It sounds like a good sort of compromise, but what will happen is, you know, if the bylaw is, is passed in its current form, perhaps, and it's limited to 10 meters, the agitation will continue by, you know, the various special interest groups over the course of time to increase that to 15 to 20 to 30. You'll, you'll get no rest, get no rest from these people. So I would say that, you know, we have sufficient protections in place uh, for the, for bylaw, uh, for the, uh, the shorelines. And I don't think we need uh, additional bylaws that will really straightjacket uh, property owners from you know, doing simple things, relatively simple things on their properties. I mean, I've, I've read through the proposed bylaw and it kind of uh, scares me, uh, you know, where you would, the, th the things you would need to get building permits for, which you don't need right now. And as I say, there's, I think there's enough protections in place right now as it is. I also have to question, you know, why did this whole shoreline bylaw um, process come to be? You know, I've, you know, there's various groups in, in Halliburton, whether it's this reshore or B-shore, whatever they're called, you hear them on the radio, they're in the newspapers. Actually, I stopped listening to canoe, uh, canoe radio in Halliburton because I'm sick and tired of listening to all this hysteria on blue-green algae, right? Uh, environment in Halliburton, they've always got these columns in the, in, in, the, in the newspapers, I'm getting sick and tired of this hysteria, right? I mean, enough is enough now. Um, also, I think there's other more practical solutions, uh, or I, I think they're a little more practical in terms of protecting our shorelines. I mean, one of the biggest problems that we have is the rising and falling of our shorelines that are part of the Trent Severance System. You might say, well, this is beyond our control. It's, it's a federal responsibility. I think there was a good start years ago when they started up that coalition of equitable water, or whatever it's called. Why does the county not uh, devote its energies really to working with uh, these other water authorities you know, to keep the water levels as constant as possible in the various lakes. Um, you know, how, how does wildlife, like loons, for example, how can they, uh, you know, nest properly in the spring? You know, they lay their nests in, 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 in water, you know, in May, and a few weeks later, they're high and dry. And there's also a lot of erosion that occurs from this up and down of the, of the water levels in the, in the lakes that feed the Trent Severn system. Someone else earlier this evening mentioned wake boats. Um, these boats, they create enormous waves. Uh, do we just tolerate that going forward and saying, well, that's nothing, you can't do anything about that? I mean, the erosion that I see just on our property, when a boat goes by, like a wake boat goes by, you know, even fairly far out in the lake at a, at a low speed, creates enormous waves that damage the shoreline, damage, uh, damage docks. Another thing you can consider too is on our lake, which is Kinesis Lake, uh, over the years, um, there's been a lot of uh, huge cottages that have been built on the properties there. Uh, you know, can we not limit the size of cottages on, on certain lakes? I mean, is 2,000 square feet, 3,000 square feet, isn't that enough? That should be more than adequate, as opposed to having these humongous structures on, on some of these lots that, uh, you know, affect uh, runoff and, and, uh, and, and drainage into the lake. Um, 
I guess in concluding, uh, I'd like to say, I don't think we need this bylaw. Um, and, and I don't want to fall back on a position saying that 10 meters uh, is, uh, is, is sufficient because you don't want this creep going on in future where there's this movement to have it go back up to 30 meters. And I think for one sort of administrative matter, uh, for any future meetings uh, that you do hold where you invite uh, this kind of input, I would suggest that you limit the input to three minutes because there have been some very informative presentations this evening, but there's also been a few where people are droning on about carpets of pine needles and beavers and all kinds of stuff like that. And, you know, we want to get our points of view in here. And if you limit everyone to three minutes or four minutes at the most, that should be enough to, get, to bring uh, points across. So thank you for your attention. Thank you for that, Harry. We really appreciate hearing your views. And of course, you know, in terms of the time that we're going to take, we're going to take the time that it needs to take to ensure that we hear everybody tonight, because I think everybody has sort of important uh, perspectives to share. So certainly appreciate hearing yours tonight. So thank you for that. Mike, if we can go to William Leo next, please. Hello, William. Could you please unmute your microphone? Hello, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me? I will. Yeah, I can hear you loud and clear, William. Great. Good evening. My name is William Leo. And first, I'd like to mention, I think Russ Wonker made some excellent points. Anyways, I'll try to be brief. I own a small island, which 98% of its land area is within 30 meters of its shoreline. As I understand it, basically my entire property would be subject to this bylaw. In turn, if I want to do anything with my property, I would have to apply for a relief from this bylaw. Is there going to be any considerations for properties surrounded by water, such as an exemption or reduced setback? Uh, properties such as islands have specific aspects and characteristics which differentiate them from typical mainland properties. There should be considerations made for these atypical waterfront properties and not just have them lumped in with a blanket bylaw. Thank you. Thanks, William. I think that that's a very good point. Mike, if we can move to uh, Diego Rico next, please. Sorry, bear with me one moment. Diego, if you could unmute your mic, please. Hello, Diego, are you there? Hello? Hi, Hello. Diego. Hello? Yeah, we are can you hear you. Can you hear us? Yes, I can now. Thank you. Awesome. Sorry about that. Um, just to be brief, I, I think that uh, a lot of the points I had um, have been touched on numerous times this evening. Um, but I think specifically that considering this bylaw as like somebody was mentioning before, a, a water quality bylaw or a way of monitoring the water as opposed to specific aspects, which some people may think um, affect the water quality, which I believe other things along with um, some of the ones that were mentioned, the septic systems, um, you know, open lots with water, with um, fertilized lawns that um, lead down to the lake. Marinas, I feel like are a big one. Anybody that's been living in this county or on these lakes or near a marina for any extended period of time, will know that um, maybe something should be put in place as well to maybe see how we could mediate what type of 
pollutants they may put into the water, specifically boat cleaning products, um, runoff from the undercoat of vehicles that put boats into boat launches. Um, some have, <clears throat> excuse me, some have fuel pumps um, very close to the water, if not directly on the water, fuel boats. Um, and quite often and frequently there's fuel runoff or overflow that comes out of these boats into the water. I feel like these are all things that also could be addressed um, within a much larger bylaw to preserve specifically the water quality that everybody's you know, concerned about um, and address more than one specific thing that I think is only a percentage or, or a portion of what's responsible for what everybody wants to <clears throat> remediate or try to manage going forward in the future. Um, that's about all I have to say and I appreciate your time. Okay, well, thank you, Digger. We appreciate you sort of joining us tonight and sharing your sharing your views with us for sure. Thank you. Okay, so the last speaker that we have registered uh, to speak this evening are Dave and Joan Me. So, Dave, Joan, are you on the uh, meeting this uh, this evening? Uh, they are not, Jason. They aren't. Okay. Okay. Well, that concludes the list of speakers that we had registered uh, for this evening. So I'm just opening up the participant list to see if anybody has their hand up. Okay, sort of seeing none. Um, I just wanna sort of go back uh, to Larry Gammon, who I believe is still on the line. I just wanna go back to the attendees. Larry had asked sort of three uh, sort of questions. Um, during his submission. And I think, Larry, without, I see that you're still on the, uh, in the meeting. So without getting into the details, just sort of being mindful of time, the three points that you did raise, which related to risk-based approach uh, to shoreline preservation, um, uh, shoreline road allowances, and restoration of properties that have been damaged by flooding or some sort of natural and unforeseen event are things that we are considering as part of our scope of work. Um, and that will be reflected in our finals out, uh, outcomes and our opinions or recommendations to county council. So just wanted to touch base with you on those because you had uh, sort of raised them as questions. Okay, well, that concludes um, the speakers for this evening. Garang, maybe if I can ask you to bring our presentation back up and maybe we can just sort of review the next steps with folks before handing it back to Warden Danielson who to formally conclude uh, the county council meeting this evening. Thank you, Garang. Well, um, we certainly heard, I think, an awful lot of feedback this evening. So bef before we get to next steps, I just wanted to thank everybody for taking the time to, to join tonight, especially on such a beautiful summer evening and to share your perspectives uh, with us. I think I was very impressed with the, with the level of knowledge that people have brought to the table, um, as well as sort of the, the passion that you bring as well uh, for your community. I think what I heard in the conversation is very similar to what we heard in the stakeholder interviews uh, so far. And I continue to be impressed with how much uh, people in the county, you know, value the lakes. You see the need to protect them for various reasons, economic, social, uh, environmental. And I, and I think what I heard within the various themes as well um, echoes some of the principles that we had uh, articulated earlier in the presentation around the need for an informed, a balanced, a clear, a reasonable, a fair, an effective, and an efficient and achievable process. So um, I wanted to thank everybody for sort of sharing their views. Um, Greg, maybe we can move to the next slide. What we will be doing in terms of our next steps is taking the feedback that you shared with us tonight. And I think there's an awful lot of feedback, which again, I, we appreciate as a team. We're gonna reflect on that a little bit and reflect on the feedback that we've heard through uh, our other stakeholder uh, sort of interviews. We're gonna be pulling our reflections on that together with the scientific research that Hutchinson Environmental is leading, 
our collaborative uh, research on successful practices that other municipalities are following. And we're going to compile that information in our next report to County Council. And we currently anticipate bringing that report forward to County Council uh, in August. And at that time, we're going to talk to them about, you know, here's what you've asked us to do, here's what we've accomplished to date, and here's what we're now seeing. At that time, we're very likely to put forward some preliminary directions for shoreline preservation in the county and, and very much look forward to having that discussion with county council and seeking their feedback and their direction on that. From there, as I had described earlier, we're going to go away and do some more work. And then we're going to come back to you with, with our ideas on how to move uh, this initiative forward. So we will be conducting another round of one-on-one -on -one interviews. We will be doing a second open house likely uh, in September, as well as an additional survey. So we will use that round of consultation to test some of our thinking. And then from there, we'll bring our final recommendations forward, informed by your further feedback to County Council at their meeting in October. So that's what the next steps for this process look like. Karen? And so with that, I wanted to thank everybody for, for taking the time to join us this evening, uh, for, uh, for County Council for f helping us facilitate uh, this very important session, and for the continued support and collaboration that we've been receiving from county staff to assist us with this project to date. So thank you very much. Warden Danielson, back over to you. Thank you very much, Jason, to you and, and all of your colleagues uh, for, uh, for the work that you've done tonight. I'd particularly like to thank everyone who has participated this evening. Um, you know, your, your input is extremely valuable. Um, we appreciate you sharing your perspectives and, and in particular the suggestions that we've received this evening are, are particularly interesting. Uh, so I look forward to uh, seeing the process follow through um, as you've just outlined. And having said that, um, we'll get to the formalities and I would ask for a mover and a seconder uh, for the confirming bylaw for this evening. Uh, Councillors Roberts and Moffat. Moved by Councillor Roberts, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be, be it resolved that bylaw 4061 being a bylaw to confirm the proceedings of the July 29th, 2021 special meeting of Halliburton County Council be considered to be read at first Second, third time finally passed and the seal of the corporation be affixed. All in favor? That's carried. And could I have a mover and a seconder to adjourn this evening? Okay. Councillor Rial and Moffat. Thank you. Moved by Councillor Rial, seconded by Councillor Moffat. Be it resolved that the July 29th, 2021 special meeting of Halliburton County Council be adjourned. All in favor? Thanks everyone, that's carried. Uh, just as a final note, a special thanks to Mike March for his, uh, for his guidance of the process. Thank you.